Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and thank you for stopping by. I'm looking forward to being in Kigali over the weekend where I'm speaking at uh, an, an initiative in Rwanda about personal financial management. And I haven't been there for a couple of years, so I must say I'm looking forward to that. Um, on the basis that, you know, today is a big day, well, East African Budget Day, but of course the World Cup. Um, and uh, I like this photograph from the New Yorker taken on in May 2014, Ipa, Ipanema Beach, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, photographed by Christian Franz Trenny. And there's got some people playing on the beach. I'd like to thank Beatrice Gichenge of CNBC and Nikhil Hira um, for the panel we discussion we had earlier today um, about the budget which is forthcoming later on today. And I, I took this photograph of uh, an event we were hosting on behalf of Mandarini, which are these houses uh, in Kilifi. And uh, I took this photograph of the stands. Behind it, you can see the garden. But I quite liked it. I thought it was quite arresting. The first World Cup I really remember is that one in Spain, I think, when Paolo Rossi's Italy ambushed and shot down beautiful team of Brazil, led by the 40 cigarettes a day man, Socrates, and that was an extraordinarily gripping World Cup, I must admit, and I'll also put up a photograph of Christ the Redeemer, which is such an iconic Brazilian um, statue. And then if you haven't seen this film called Central do Brasil, um, the title is in Portuguese, Central do Brasil is the name of Rio de Janeiro's main railway station. Film premiered at the 48th Berlin International Film Festival. Um, I'll put up a link for that film on YouTube and it really is a remarkable movie. My macro thoughts are, as per my tweet from a few hours ago, that China has been lifting the price of WTI in the last few weeks. And I think that's an important geopolitical signal in the noise. Mia Farrow tweeted a, a, an early morning photograph yesterday of berries from her garden, summertime. They did look rather delicious. Political reflections, all of Tikrit is in the hands of the militants, a police colonel told the AFP. The Iraqi city of Tikrit has been seized by fighters from the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Security force sources have said the second city to fall to the group in two days. It's been a lightning move. And uh, its military speed and precision probably informs us that these are um, Ba'ath army elements as well. Sources told Al Jazeera on Wednesday that gunmen had set up checkpoints around Tikrit which lies between the capital, Baghdad, and Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, which was captured by the ISIL on Tuesday. New York Times also reported on Wednesday that Iraq's Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, had repeatedly asked the US to launch drone attacks and airstrikes against the fighters since last month, but Washington had so far refused to get involved. You know, in some respects, the ISIL is an intelligence asset of a kind. And uh, the question is, you know, uh, it seems to me it's a very, very bold move that made here. And it's going to be interesting to watch how strongly the U.S. gets behind al-Maliki, who to some people is an Iranian asset anyway. Um, and it probably suits some of the more die-hard recalcitrants when it comes to Iran in particular, like Saudi Arabia and Israel, to put some pressure on Iraq. But uh, it's a fluid situation, no doubt. The collapse of government forces set to number 60,000 in the region before several hundred insurgents is a humiliation for the central government. Indeed it is. Chinese fighter jets flew abnormally close to Japanese military surveillance planes in the East China Sea. The second incident in less than a month, Japan's Ministry of Defense said the Su-27 fighters came as near as 30 meters to one Japanese plane and 45 meters to another, according to Japan's self-defense forces. The incident happened over international waters between 11 a.m. and midday yesterday. 
Japan's foreign ministry protested by China's embassy in Tokyo. Close encounters follow a near miss on May 24th amid tensions between China and Japan over disputed territory. Ships and planes from the countries have tailed one another around the East China Sea Islands known as Senkaku in Japan and Daiyu in China. And my conclusions are, you know, the calibration has been very finely tuned. It's like a little bit of a ballet at times. But at any moment, and, but at any moment you know, it could deteriorate. Um, I'll put a photograph of a Chinese Su-27 fighter flying over the East China Sea in this handout photograph taken May 24, 2014, released by the Defence Ministry of Japan. Australia have waded in and said Japan should play a bigger part in resolving conflicts in the Asia-Pacific region where it is caught up in a territorial dispute with neighbour China. This is the Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. We see Japan taking an ever-increasing role in some of the areas of conflict, some of the challenging environments, Bishop said in a phone interview from Tokyo. Australia's Defence Minister David Johnson and Foreign, and Foreign Minister Julie Bishop Posed for a photograph with Shinzo Abe, which I'll put up. That was taken June 11th. Then Vietnam has said China has sent six warships to the rig in the disputed seas. Vietnam said China again shifted an oil rig it has placed in disputed waters with six warships guarding the structure as the two communist countries continue their South China Sea standoff. The rig was moved for a third time and remains off Vietnam's coast in an area claimed by both countries. There are now six Chinese warships, 38 Coast Guard vessels, 13 cargo ships and 19 tugboats protecting it, the paper said. By placing its oil rig in the disputed area last month and in constructing artificial islands near the Spratleys, China is mapping out an aggressive strategy. Um, it's an escalation. We are really reaching a regional crisis stage. It seems that China has re reached a decision to go for broke. China is Vietnam's largest trading partner, with two-way trade rising 22% to $50.2 billion last year from 2012. And this is all around the pivot, which I've spoken about before, where I just described it in December last year, as the encirclement of China, then the shrinking of its operating theater and then potentially lighting the tinderbox, that is the periphery Xinjiang refers, which I think might well morph into China's Afghanistan. You will recall that the architect of Russia's defeat in Afghanistan was Zygmunt Brzezinski, and he remains a foreign policy eminent screens with the president's ear. I said then that the US probably feels it holds a decisive hard power advantage at this moment, and given that the trajectory is one of gradual erosion of that decisive advantage, that leads me to the view that this pivot to Asia has a logic and momentum of its own. Therefore, I see the US being increasingly determined to press its advantage. One might even posit that calming down the Iranian front allows the US better to concentrate its energies on the pivot to Asia. Also, you know, that Ukrainian situation puts Iran into a better position because Iranian gas could very well be the backstop vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, um, uh, Russia. One of the key elements of the pivot to Asia is the air-sea battle concept. This concept envisages the battle beginning with a blinding attack against China's uh, Chinese anti-access facilities and incorporates distant blockade operations. I just don't think the blinding attack is politically feasible in the 21st century, or as the distant blockade operations are. China's dependence on foreign oil is increasing, just as the US's dependency is decreasing. And interestingly, given my belief that the eastern seaboard of Africa is a fabulous energy prize, that puts the Indian Ocean in many respects right into the geopolitical fray. If you are considering distant blockade operations, one of those areas you will be blockading is this part of the world given the amount of energy that is likely to be sold into Asia in the future. Currency markets, the euro is still soft at 135.43. This is all about lower short-term interest rates, um, which, is a, which is an effect of the latest draggy plan. 
Um, dollar index 80.74, but really top of the range here, 80, 80, 80, 85 is sort of right at the top. Japanese yen 102.08, Swiss 0.8995, pound 167.96. It will resume its upwards march. It's in a process of consolidation right now. I think you buy it for a move up to 173.50. Aussie 0.9373. Um, employment data sort of uh, twin sided confused a few market participants from the reports I could read India rupee 59.315 obviously the central bank in there trying to defend that 59 level um, and keep the rupee above it or below it South Korean 11061685 that's a 2008 high real 223.30 I'll show you some uh, Brazilian data in a minute. Egyptian pound 7.1501, stable at these sorts of levels after that quick slide that took us through seven not too long ago. And the Rand weaker 10.7516, talk of a downgrade. Dollar index, I'll put up a three month chart. I think it's very near the top of the range here, but given the weakness in the euro, that's gonna to continue to support that dollar index. I'll put up a euro dollar three month chart, 135.43. Um, it trades quite with some resilience in my views. I, I, I don't believe it's going to just drop away, but I think it's going to erode lower over time and gradually. Gold, one year chart, 1260.76. Yesterday touched 1265.32, which was the highest level since May 28. I remain at that. I think we've had a bit of short covering going on after that sharp break lower. Crude oil, 104.56. China on the buy side, lifting prices. WTI um, closed at 104.61, sorry, closed at 104.41, highest close since March the 3rd. And uh, volume of all futures traded was about 6% below the 100 day moving average. So on par, price is up 6.3% this year. But clearly to me, the price pattern that we're seeing in crude oil is informing me that China is taking a much more defensive posture. It is worried about things like distant blockade operations. It will continue to be a big buyer and therefore you know there is a signal in that crude oil price um, and geopolitical noise coming to emerging markets i'll put up a one-year chart of the brazilian real of course we slipped sharply but we started to rebound uh, rebound a little bit it would be interesting to keep an eye on this now and see if, whether there is any pop from the effect of the world cup I'll put up a one-year chart of that compares the Bavespa to the S&P. The Bavespa has underperformed the S&P over 12 months. Um, I'm going to put up a photograph that I like of the Palacio de Alvarado. This is the official presidential residence in Brasilia. Uh, it's situated in a large park filled with flora and fauna typical to Brazil. The president's house is a sort of modernism lover's dream home. It's spacious with giant rolling doors on two sides. A cool breeze practically howls through the living area, especially just before a storm. And the Itamarati Palace in Brasilia boasts the largest hall without columns in South America. Draws your eye to the one vertical element in the room, the spectacular spiral staircase. It's so wide, our guide pointed out that it doesn't need banisters because it's impossible to fall off. Even so, a temporary banister was installed to accommodate a visit from Queen Elizabeth II. Coming to Sub-Saharan Africa, he said funding for humanitarian work in Somalia had dropped off a cliff, even though a top UN official had warned of worrying parallels between now and 2010, the year before a famine killed hundreds of thousands of people. Somalia entering a critical phase, and it was far too soon to reduce the international effort to help it, Kay said. Reducing it now could have severe humanitarian and security consequences in the region. International donors promised 1.8 billion euros in reconstruction aid for Somalia at a Brussels conference last September. The 20-nation European Union is already the largest donor to the country in the Horn of Africa, led the financial pledges, committing 650 million euros. Even so, Kay said there was around $750 million funding gap for humanitarian work in Somalia this year. Kenya, of course, has suffered a series of gun and grenade attacks in recent months, blamed on Al-Shabaab or its sympathizers, raising concern about spreading violence. Kay said Al-Shabaab had had a regional intent and capability.
for some time. But the regional focus is probably becoming even more pronounced now as they are under pressure in Somalia. Interesting point. It poses a significant threat to security, he said. This is an organization with an agenda that is beyond just Somalia. Um, so clearly, you know, that's an interesting point he's making that, you know, victory on the battlefield in Somalia is displacing Al Shabaab, which might well be true. I'll put up a photograph of Westgate that I took. Um, and it best symbolizes for me the asymmetric risks that Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram pose. The Rwandan government said on Wednesday that it had killed five soldiers from neighboring DRC after a group of them crossed the border into their country and opened fire. These actions by the DRC are jeopardizing the region's extensive efforts to ensure peace, stability and development for all our, our citizens, said Louise Mushikiwabo, who is the foreign affairs minister was once an excellent guest on Mindspeak. The US Geological Survey has estimated that more gas lies off the shores of Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique than off Nigeria. Around 180 trillion cubic feet of gas has been found in Mozambique's Rahuma Basin. Uh, this will be enough to supply Germany, Britain, France, and Italy for some 18 years. The Mozambique discoveries have changed the world. That's why people are still interested in East Africa. Miles Donnelly, the commercial director of the oil and gas exploration firm Bahari Resources. They're on a scale which would, could be comparable to Qatar, he said. And that's what I said on the 3rd of June, that Mozambique could be the next Qatar. I said today it is self-evident that Mozambique sits on gas reserves, which will, if the execution is optimal, an optimal execution around our natural resources is a sine qua non of the Africa rising narrative, in my opinion, transform Mozambique into the next Qatar. I'll put up a photograph of Maputo taken what, that evening I was uh, uh, there um, last month, and another one of Pemba taken from the sky as we landed in Pemba and then took off again to come back to Nairobi. And finally, you know, I was at that Africa Rising conference and I took a photograph of the poster and I tweeted, it, Af I tweeted Africa Rising, but no longer in the rising tide floats all boats where it was in 2012 and 2013. South African all share up 9.518% and just off an all time high. Dollar Rand softened uh, to 1075.23, concerns around imminent and potential downgrade. Egyptian pound, as I said, 6.7.15.03. The Egyptian stock market, Africa's best in 2014, bounced another 1.65% yesterday. It's now up 28.398% this year. The Nigerian all share, which is at a strong four weeks, is now plus 0.7573% in 2014. The UN Security Council is set to sanction Abu Bakr Shekau, leader of Nigeria's Boko Haram, the first individual and entity to be designated by the world body since the Islamist militant group was blacklisted last month. And I wrote about him on the 28th of April 2014 uh, when he taunted President Goodluck Jonathan with the comment, I am in your city. And I said, or oh, is it cities? I'll put up a photograph of him and I, I characterize him as the taunter. You can see why from the photograph. Taunt is to reproach in a sarcastic, insulting, or jeering manner. Mock, to provoke by taunts, twit, and insulting jibe or sarcasm. The Ghana Stock Exchange is up 9.743% this year, but all your gains have been eroded by the free-falling city. Annual consumer price inflation rose to four and a half year high of 14.8%. Interesting piece that I found about the changing face of West African retail growing middle class in West Africa drives a boom in consumer demand. Actis has earmarked funds of over $500 million for commercial property development across the region's two biggest economies. We have easily over half a billion dollars for buildings we are developing in Ghana and Nigeria, said the director of real estate in Actis' Lagos office. Africa's home to the world's youngest and fastest growing population, according to McKinsey. Estimates household expenditure on the continent will expand 63% to $1.4 trillion by 2020. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa, with an economy that's been growing around 6% for a decade, and a rising middle class with a history of high expenditure abroad. Talking about ShopRite gain, 
using new malls to gain a foothold across their home continent. Um, saying that uh, uh, international brands are increasingly following suit, clothing, automotives, food, supermarket companies, including the likes of Porsche, Carrefour, Porsche stand up here, Carrefour stand up here, Domino's have already entered Nigeria. Bit of a replay for Kenya, it seems. Major groups like Debenhams have been exploring luxury retailers, including Salvatore Ferragamo, Burberry, Ralph Lauren, are looking at ways of coming into the market. Interesting. Coming to Kenya, as I said, uh, I participated in an article for Institutional Investor, Kenya preparing to join Africa's budding Europe on crowd. I st I'm in this range of 675% to 7.25%. Um, that's based on, that's informed by the sharp rally we've seen in Egypt, improvement in Zambia on the basis of the IMF coming into support. That's improved the entire backdrop and I think it's made it more interesting. Uh, at, at around seven percent level, I think seven and a quarter if they raise two billion dollars, which I think they will. Um, this infographic I got from Business Daily, which shows the allocated budget versus actual spending for 2013 2014, and it's interesting that the government always undershoots by quite a margin that sometimes is not factored into budget calculations. Kenya shilling slipped to 87.80 yesterday, um, the biggest drop in seven weeks against the dollar. T prices at a one-year low. You can see two big pillars of our economy, tea and tourism, very soft indeed, which is why I don't see uh, the economy growing uh, more than 5%. I think it'll be sub-5% again for the third year running, I'm afraid. Um, Nairobi all shares up 9.835% this year. Um, fell 0.1% yesterday. It's been on a strong run, but it's been it's, it's about 2% below an all-time high set in May, uh, probably exactly a month ago. The NAC20 is down 1.908% in 2014 and just marginally above two and a, three and a half month lows. And uh, at that, I'm going to leave you, and I appreciate the support that you give me. I'm thankful for that.